Today on God's Art Ministries, Revelation on the Book of Matthew, Part 1. The Gospel of Grace to the World. God is ready. We are ready. Are you ready to take this world for a spin and let Revelation begin? Be sure to visit, like, and share our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash God's Art and Word. Visit our website at godsartministries.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at God's Art Ministries and give your best love gift at paypal.me forward slash God's Art Ministries. Praise the Lord. Amen. Rest in Jesus while Pastor G feeds you the Word of God. All right. I want to start off here in chapter one about the Gospels. Who are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? A fisherman, a tax collector, doctor, and another who was just a teenager when he heard our Lord and Savior speak. These men wrote some of the most famous books in existence in one of the oldest and best-selling books in the world, as we know as the Bible. Hallelujah. One of the most important things to remember when reading the Bible is to depend on God for the revelation of what you're reading. In no way, shape, or form am I indicating that the Bible is incorrect, untrue, nor the writings of this book incorrect. When it comes to the biblical scripture, there are so many scriptures from early writings that tie together in the newer writings. However, man has written and rewritten, translated and retranslated, and also allowed Satan to bring translations forward that do not compare to the original scripture. These issues bring forth one of the most well-known and used scriptures from the Bible. Proverbs 3, starting in verse 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Amen. We must depend on God for the revelation of what we're reading and to make our best attempts in the flesh to receive the message that God is giving us through his word. Amen. Everyone has their own comfort with the translation that they like and appreciate. Depending on God to reveal the truth in his word is part of what he wants us to do according to his word. Jesus himself reveals this in scripture. Those who truly seek to understand build an understandable and a loving relationship with God, will humble themselves and become childlike to learn from the Word of God, Jesus Christ. To humble yourself to become childlike is to allow God to teach you about Him, about His Word, Christ Jesus, and about the Holy Spirit. And we do this. God, when we come to Him as a child, he will grow us up in Christ. Amen. In Matthew 11, come to me and I will give you rest. Starting at verse 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and any one to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Hallelujah. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I want to explain to you, the first four books of the New Testament are called the Gospels. It's easy to understand why these books are so important, and why they were written by these particular men. The excitement that these books brought to many so long ago from the writers who walked with Jesus still excite us today as we look at the walk that Jesus walked and the many awesome things he spoke of to these men and the others around him. 
Matthew and John were two of the original 12 apostles. They were with the Savior often as he taught. But who were Mark and Luke? How did they come to write about the Savior's life and his ministry? We're going to discuss these guys, and these are just a few things that biblical scholars know about the Gospels and the four men who put the testimonies to paper regarding our King, Lord, Savior, Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Matthew, before his call to follow Jesus as one of the Lord's apostles, Matthew was a publican or a tax collector. Because of his work, we can only imagine that he was a well-educated man, knew how to read and write, probably in several languages, including Greek and Arabic. He saw and heard many wonderful things while with the Savior, and it is likely that he wrote some of the sayings of the Savior as notes or maybe in a journal. Many things would have taken too long to write in detail while in the moment and Matthew would have used these notes later to write more in-depth about the teachings of Jesus being guided by the Holy Spirit. In his book, Matthew often stresses that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and came to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. Much of these writings in Matthew were wrote specifically to the Jews who were acquainted and or well adapted with those prophecies. Already well known as a tax collector, Matthew was a man who could have moved contentedly in and out of political circles, and his book mentions certain things that only someone in his position would know. For example, his account of the resurrection tells that those assigned to guard the Savior's tomb saw two angels roll back the stone that covered the tomb where Jesus' body was placed. They told their superiors what happened, and the soldiers were offered large sums of money to say that the Lord's followers had crept in and carried his body away. This lie was then spread among the Jews. Matthew has been informed about the corruption and the lie. The book of Matthew is the only place this information is told. The Report of the Garden in Matthew 28, starting in verse 11. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Who was Mark? Mark was much younger than the other writers of the gospel. His mother was a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Acts 12.12 12 tells us, that her house in Jerusalem was used as a meeting place for other disciples. From this verse, we also learn that her son's full name is John Mark. Mark was most likely a teen while being a follower of Jesus Christ when the Lord was in Jerusalem. He may have seen and heard the testimonies of the Lord on numerous occasions. After the resurrection, as the Savior's message was beginning to spread, Mark traveled with the Apostle Paul. He then accompanied the Apostle Peter to Rome and stayed near him while he was in prison. Mark is known as Peter's interpreter, both in speech and in writing. Being a fisherman from Galilee, he may have used Mark to interpret for him in the Greek, as he may not have been fluent in this language. Due to Mark and Peter's relationship, Mark wrote down many of the observations and recollections of Peter's walk with the Messiah as one of the original apostles. 
Mark's book reflects Peter's concentration in spreading the gospel among the Gentiles and later to the world. Hallelujah. Luke did not know Jesus Christ personally, which makes him an interesting writer from the recollection of eyewitness accounts. He became a follower after the death and resurrection of Jesus when Paul taught him the gospel. Luke had been a physician, but he left his practice to learn and travel with Paul. He had the opportunity to talk with many of the apostles as well as others who were eyewitnesses to special events, moments, and teachings in the Lord's life. In the first few verses of his book, Luke says that he is going to write the things that eyewitnesses and other teachers of the gospel had to say about Jesus. Apparently, he had the opportunity to talk with many who were present when Jesus taught or performed miracles. In Luke 1 verse 1 through 3, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also having all things closely for some time past to write an orderly account for you. Most excellent, Theopolis, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. One of the most amazing stories that Luke wrote about was the birth of our Savior. It's likely because of the great detail and information that Luke acquired about Jesus' birth may have originated from Mary herself, amen, because it is so very detailed. Okay, moving on to the last book of the Gospels, the book of John, also known as John the Beloved, as he was known, served as one of the apostles. His book was probably written last because John seems to have already read the other Gospels before he wrote his own book. Often, instead of telling his version of an event or parable the others had already written about, John writes about things the other writers did not include. John the Beloved may have had some of John the Baptist's writings, as the Gospel of John includes testimonies of John the Baptist. John's writings focused on the members of the church who were already familiar and knew certain things about the Lord. Therefore, he stresses more on Jesus' divine being as the Son of God. We see in the last five verses of the book of John what could have happened to John, referring to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. John tells us that Jesus, having all authority, could will that John remain on earth until the second coming of Jesus. This is found in John 21, starting in verse 22. Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? The four separate books. Just after the Lord's death and resurrection, many years after each of the books written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were each a separate item written on separate scrolls, and copied over and over. The individual books weren't put together into the New Testament until several hundred years after they were written. The rest of the New Testament, after the four Gospels, the book of Acts records the events following the ascension of the Lord and Savior. Most of these scholars agree that Luke wrote the Acts of the Apostles, 
nearly all of the rest of the books in the New Testament are letters or epistles, with Paul writing most of them, but are included letters written by James, Peter, John, and Jude. The book of Revelation written by John concludes the collection we now call the New Testament. The Old and the New Testament, something that is very important to remember that most don't understand is that when Jesus was alive, he was fulfilling the Old Testament covenant between man and God, and at the same time, bringing forth direction and understanding of the new eternal covenant through his blood as the ultimate sacrifice. Amen? It was not until he spoke on the cross, it is finished until the Old Testament covenant was fulfilled. The New Testament eternal covenant started when his side was pierced and the blood and water was brought forth to save the world in all those who believe and accept him as their Lord and Savior, and he ascended to the Father. He sat down on the mercy seat, and the mercy seat was covered with the blood. Romans 14, 8. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Amen. Matthew 1, 1 through 16 explains the genealogy from the son of David and the son of Abraham starting with Abraham and ending up with Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. In verse 17, so all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to Christ is 14 generations. It's such a blessing to see the ancestry of Jesus spelled out in the Bible for us, to understand Jesus' bloodline and the things that some of them went through is absolutely awesome. We look back to Adam and Eve, then to Noah, and we understand that regardless of what many might think, our bloodline still remains from Adam and Eve. When God destroyed mankind in the Great Flood, the bloodline continued through Noah, his sons, and daughters that were with him. For us to understand that science has proven that all blood is different through DNA processing, and to know that we were all formed by God through the first Adam, we truly begin to see the majestic abilities of God, not only through the Word, but through science as well. What if science could prove beyond a doubt that in some shape or form, in the human body, that we all have one characteristic that is the same? There are a few ways. The first is to simply stand and stretch your arms out to the side, and it will reveal a similar posture that Jesus suffered for all of us on the cross. Second, we all contain the same organs for survival. The third is laminin, which is a high molecular weight protein of the extracular matrix. They are a major component of the basal lamina, one of the layers of the basement membrane, a protein network foundation for most cells and organs. Look at that. A protein network found for most cells and organs. This laminin is in the shape of a cross, people, and not one in the human body is the same. Jesus is the foundation of our salvation, the cornerstone of the church, and we have a cross-like component for our very survival. Laminin, uniquely shaped, in the form of a cross, and it is inside every human being alive on this earth. Hallelujah. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. 
He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Amen. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Amen. God knew everything before he created us in his image. Jesus went to the cross for us, and through science, it is proven that the cross lives in us. Amen. That's just further confirmation that Christ suffered and died for all of us, for sin, sickness, and disease. Christ's suffering were out of love from God, the Word of God, which is Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Romans 1, verse 19. For the truth about God is known to them instinctively. God has put his knowledge in their hearts. Amen. But what's so significant about the 14 generations and then again another 14 generations in the Bible from Abraham leading to Jesus Christ? Numbers in the Bible are significant. The number seven means rest and perfection. The number 14 is a multiple of seven or as an example two times seven equals 14. 14 partakes of its importance and implies a double measure of spiritual perfection. The number two, when combined two by seven, may, however, bring its own significance into its meaning, as it does in Matthew 1. Here we see the genealogy of Christ divided up and given in sets of 14 generations two being associated with incarnation, okay? Incarnation means a person who embodies in the flesh of deity, spirit, or abstract quality. In addition, the number 14 represents deliverance or salvation, hallelujah. The 14th day of the month is the Passover. When God delivered the firstborn of Israel from death some 430 years earlier, on the night of the 14th day of the first month, God made two covenant promises to Abraham, one of the physical seed, Isaac and his descendants, and one of the spiritual seed, Jesus Christ and the sons of God who would come through him, who would shine like the stars of heaven. See Matthew 13, 43. On the day portion of the 14th, God confirmed the promises with a special covenant sacrifice. This is found in Genesis 15, starting in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram, not Abraham, Abram, in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. 
And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. On the fourteenth day of the first month, Jesus Christ, God manifested in the flesh, the only begotten Son of God the Father, the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world, was crucified as the perfect sacrifice to save mankind from sin. Jesus' death on Passover completed his ministry in the flesh. Three years, three years, three years, three years. Seven represents completion. Thus, seven plus seven equals 14, indicating a double completion. Number one, Jesus' ministry in the flesh was completed. Number two, the second seven, Jesus' sacrifice ended or fulfilled the need for animal sacrifices. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord Jesus. It's so very awesome how God creates so many things with such awesome meaning. Knowing that Jesus brings a double measure of spiritual perfection is such a blessing and a precious gift that God gave us when he sent Jesus to walk this earth in flesh and bone and die on the cross as the ultimate sacrifice to bring us eternal salvation. Amen. Okay, continuing on in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is regarding the birth of Jesus Christ. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Amen. Another great scripture, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Hallelujah. All right, going to move on to Matthew 2. The visit of the wise men. Something very important to remember and understand is Matthew 2 and Luke 2, the birth of Jesus and the visit of the wise men, are two separate time periods. The wise men did not come and see the newborn baby Jesus, and we're going to touch on this. Now, starting in chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem 
of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For some of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was, not the newborn baby, the child. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child, not into the manger to the, see the newborn, but they were going into the house. They saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Many people are so misinformed and confused about Jesus' birth by placing of the wise men at his birth in the manger. There were three gifts given by the wise men, but there could have been many present. They were gold. Gold is a precious metal, and as such was and still is a very valuable and precious metal today. Its value could very well have financed Joseph, Mary, and Jesus' trip to Egypt and their provisional needs met during their stay. Gold is a symbol of divinity and is mentioned throughout the Bible. Pagan idols were often made from gold and the Ark of the Covenant was overlaid with gold. You can find that in Exodus 25, 10-17. The gift of gold to the young Jesus was symbolic of his divinity, God in flesh. Frankincense is a white resin or gum. It is obtained from a tree by making incisions in the bark and allowing the gum to flow out of the tree and then captured into a small vessel of some sort. It is a highly fragrant when burned and was therefore used in worship, where it was burned as a pleasant offering to God. You can see this in Exodus 30, 34. Frankincense is a symbol of holiness and righteousness. The gift of frankincense to the young Jesus was symbolic of his willingness to become a sacrifice, wholly giving himself up, related to a burnt offering. Mir was also a product of Arabia and was obtained from a tree in the same manner as frankincense. It was a spice and was used in embalming. It was also sometimes mingled with wine to form an article of drink. Such a drink was given to our Savior when he was about to be crucified as a stupefying potion. See Mark 
Matthew 27, 34 refers to it as gall, very bitter. Mir symbolizes bitterness, suffering, and affliction. The young Jesus would grow to suffer greatly as a man and would pay the ultimate price when he gave his life on the cross for all of mankind. Correction of who was present at the birth of the newborn King Jesus is found in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 through 21. These are the shepherds that came to see a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. So we see that the wise men were not there. They came when Jesus was about two years old. They came to his house and they saw him as a child. King Herod had ordered all children two years of age and under to be killed. That's why Mary, Joseph, and Jesus fled to Egypt. That was part of the gold that was given to them was to finance their trip. God made all their provisions. Amen. So it's important to read the Bible carefully and allow yourself to be directed by the Holy Spirit. We should read a bit and then ask God for the revelation of what we're reading to be revealed according to his truth. Knowing the Word of God, simply stated, is knowing Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God who was wrapped in flesh and bone. He was given by God for the fulfillment of the law set out in the Old Testament to be punished for our sins, delivered us from our sickness and our disease, and to give eternal life to all that believe in him. Amen. So the blood of Jesus is so very precious, so very precious. And we need to remind ourselves often of what he did for us. God's love can be seen from Genesis to Revelation in the Bible, yet many times he is misconstrued as an evil or mean God. However, if you look closely at the New Testament and rely upon God for the revelation, you can see Jesus throughout the Old Testament and the love that God had and has for all of mankind through his actions, his promises, and covenants made with many for all of mankind. Amen. So we see the flight to Egypt in verse 13 through 15. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Didn't say take the newborn baby. Take the child and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. He did not want a new king being born that threatened his rulership. Amen. So Joseph rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. The Lord spoke to Joseph and told him to rise and take the child and his mother to Egypt. A sure way of saving the life of baby Jesus from King Herod who wanted to kill him because he did not want Jesus to take over his rule as king. But what Herod didn't understand is he was not just going to be king of the Jews. He was going to be king over everything, over everything. Amen. From the very birth of Jesus, King Herod believed that Jesus would simply rule his territory and did not understand the fact that Jesus was going to be king and would rule over the entire world and all of creation. Amen. This would have been a very difficult adventure for them, leaving all they had behind in the middle of the night and traveling such a far distance from home. Jesus was born into poverty as a king of all men. 
yet gives us all the riches of the kingdom of heaven through salvation brought forth by his blood. Hallelujah. The visit of the wise men would have brought the gift of gold to assist them in their fleeing to Egypt. This would have allowed for a new start for the family and ensuring that the defenseless young Jesus would have traveled safely to Egypt with Joseph and Mary and would have provided their needs for survival through the gift of gold. Hallelujah. In verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise man, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children, she refused to be comforted because they were no more. The fear-stricken King Herod orders all of the male children under two years of age to be killed because he did not want to give up his rule as king. Satan didn't know exactly who the Savior was at this time, so to ensure his death, Satan used King Herod to destroy many small children trying to chase down Jesus and kill him. Satan continues to use people for these types of killings even today, whether they be one at a time or many. The return to Nazareth, verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea, in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled that he would be called a Nazarene. This begins the establishment of Jesus in the land of Israel and the misconception that Jesus was not truly the Messiah because he was to come out of Bethlehem, which he did. Many called him a Nazarene in the Bible because that is where his family ended up settling upon their return from Egypt. Hallelujah. Philippians 1, 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You know, we want to thank you right now for sharing with us in the Word of God, for letting us feed you, for letting us give you some revelation and insight of what God shares with us to share with the world. We keep everything that we do free to the world. We don't want to hinder any of God's children from receiving the revelation. And we ask that you help keep that in place in this ministry. And, and you can do that through your love gifts and your offerings. We thank you and praise you. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the rest that we find in Jesus by you seating us with Christ at your right hand. We thank you for that. As you put everything evil under Jesus' feet, Father, we know that that same evil, because we're seated with Jesus, is under our feet as well. We thank you for being a loving Father. We thank you for the revelation that you give through your Holy Spirit, according to the word Christ Jesus, we just praise you and thank you and give you glory for everything that you're doing for us today. You first loved us, God. That's why we can love you and we can love the others in the world. 
Father, we pray for those lost souls right now that they come to find Jesus as their personal Savior, that they accept your word, Father, as truth, as their Savior. We praise you and we thank you for, for gathering your sheep to come and listen and to feed on your word. Lord, just like you told Peter, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus replied, feed my lambs. The second time, tend my sheep. The third time, feed my sheep. Lord, we do your will right now by feeding your lambs the milk of the word, by tending and keeping protected over your flock, Lord, and feeding them the meat of the word. We thank you so much for that privilege. It's an honor to serve you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name, and we all said amen. Praise the Lord. Come back tomorrow. We're going to have part one continued in the book of Matthew. It's going to be awesome. We love you and have a great day, blessed in God. Amen.